Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, depending on where you are joining this program. Welcome to LM News special webinar on the impact of technology on global human resource management. My name is Young Sun Pat. I'm a professor of international business and management at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California, and director of the Center for International Business Education, often called CYB or CYBER. This program is funded by the grants awarded by the U.S. Department of Education and sponsored by the LMU side and also the study abroad office. LMU is one of 15 universities in the country that received a very prestigious cyber grants. As part of our mission to help improve global competitiveness of the U.S. businesses, LMU CYB has organized special lecture series on various important topics of international business and management. Today, in the spirit of celebrating International Education Week, we have prepared a great program to discuss the impact of technology on international mobility and its implications for global talent management. International Education Week was created as a joint initiative of the U.S. Department of State and the Department of Education to promote programs that prepare Americans for a global market and attract future leaders from abroad to learn and exchange experiences. Professor Wayne Cassio, one of the most prominent HR scholars will deliver a keynote speech. Following his lecture, Professor Alan Ansher will moderate a panel discussion. While physical mobility of people ceased or reduced during the pandemic, Companies are increasingly leveraging the benefits of technology by creating a global virtual teams as a new platform. How effectively can technology substitute for global mobility or international assignments? This is a valid question as the direct work experience with host country workforce and cultural emotion experience are critical to become global leaders. I'm sure our panelists will help us better understand this issue. Before we start the program, I'd like to introduce our Dean of College of Business Administration, Dr. Dale Smith, and she will say a few words to welcome you. Dr. Smith. Thank you, Young Sung. And on behalf of the College of Business Administration at Loyola Marymount University, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome all of you to this webinar. Um, what an incredibly relevant and current topic. Just a few hours ago, literally, I think it was one o'clock this afternoon, I was on an international call speaking with my colleagues in Ireland, in Australia, in Germany, New York, and then me here in California. And to think that, you know, it wasn't a few years ago, even pre-pandemic, where the thought of a conference call required so much logistical efforts. And here, a quick email got us on a call doing strategic planning for the International Association of Jesuit Business Deans. So I know personally, Technology has impacted the way we work together, the way we are on global teams. And I know tonight will be a wonderful evening for those of us joining in the evening to hear more about the impact of technology on global HR issues. So without that much further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce one of my faculty members, the moderator tonight, Professor Ellen Ensher, herself an HR uh, specialist and expert in a variety of areas uh, to introduce our speaker. Over to you, Alan. Thank you, Dale. Appreciate it. Thank you, Young Sun. We are so happy to see all of you. And we are delighted to welcome our speakers with us tonight. So um, our speakers have quite impressive and voluminous bios. So I am not going to read about all of their accomplishments. I'm going to give you just a little taste so as um, my colleague had mentioned, Dr. Peck, first we will have Wayne Cassio, Professor Wayne Cassio, who is a distinguished professor emeritus at the University of Colorado. He is a prolific author, a thought leader in management. Generations of students have read and generations of professors have used his books and I personally have, and I'm, I'm quite grateful for all of Wayne's good work. Um, and I will actually introduce the other panelists and then we'll you know, give you a little bit of a taste um, of what Wayne will be starting us off with. So also with us um, is a 
brand new, well, not brand new, but a, a, I guess new by LMU standards colleague, Nancy Blustrick, who is our vice president of human resources here at LMU. She joins us with just an amazing background. Um, she was the executive vice president of international operations and global human resources for Damon Worldwide, a $15 billion organization with over 16,000 employees worldwide. And I know that um, she is also an, an, an expert in HR and an inveterate traveler. And we are so happy to have you as part of our community and family. And then finally, um, Roberto Castillo, who is a talent acquisition specialist with the United States Secret Service. And thank you, Roberto, for your service. He comes to us with um, over 20 years or served 20 years of honorable service with the United States Marine Corps, was deployed to combat zones, including Iraq and Afghanistan. And now um, ha is recruiting for the Secret Service. So just such a wealth of perspectives and I'm very excited to learn from all of you. So we'll hear from Wayne and then um, I will pose some questions. And for all of you listening, feel free to put your questions in the chat. We'll reserve 10 or 15 minutes at the end where you can ask questions and this will be posted later on the side website as well as on YouTube. So at this point, I'm gonna invite Wayne Cassio to start us off um, with a keynote. Hello, Wayne, welcome. Thank you, Alan. I'm gonna hit uh, share screen and hopefully that will work. Yep, here we go. Uh, I thought I might say just a few words. Uh, Yang Sung asked me to say a few words about uh, the future of work and uh, cross-border talent management. And uh, I'll step through these slides fairly quickly so that we can get on to the discussion. But when we think about the future of work, we need to answer a couple of questions. One of them is who's going to do it? Uh, Full-time or part-time people, gig workers more and more, or even crowdsourcing. And when we think about where the work is going to get done and when, uh, some people are in uh, co-located -lo co workspaces. I was just in New York last, uh, New York City last week, at the National Academy of Human Resources, and several people in the in the banking industry were talking about how their CEOs have uh, just required people to come back to the office, everybody, full time. And uh, but that's not typical. More and more, we're seeing hybrid and remote schedules, uh, fluid work schedules, uh, no matter where people are located. And that includes managers. Managers are very happy with uh, with fluid work schedules and hybrid. And then finally, how the how is the work going to get done? There's a lot of scare tactics going on about the impact of uh, artificial intelligence and the loss of jobs. I know that. You all in Los Angeles, we're seeing the, the writer strike uh, earlier this summer, largely concerned about the potential loss of jobs through uh, artificial intelligence. Um, and also uh, Goldman Sachs came out with a report uh, saying that as many as uh, 300 million jobs could be automated in coming years. Um, but there's uh, a lot of disagreement about that. I think the, uh, the general feeling now is that uh, among experts is that uh, AI will augment rather than replace uh, most work being done. In terms of uh, hybrid work, I said it was here to stay and, and truly it is. And so for every company, it's got to think through when do we have to be together? Uh, why, do why should people come into the office? What's the purpose? Uh, McKinsey's recent research said uh, almost 60% of U.S. employees could work remotely some, at least some of the time. And the U.K. firm Manpower Incorporated said that in multinationals, at least 30% of the work could be done anywhere, really did not have to be um, on site. And if we think about the best places to do work uh, in office, 
best for deep thinking, creative tasks, uh, culture building events, uh, strategic collaboration. This makes good sense. On the other hand, uh, there's great concern about remote workers and hybrid workers that because they aren't in the office, there's something called proximity bias, which means that managers are more likely to promote those who are in the office and give them the very best assignments. And so there's a, a great need to guard against that. If we think about the ability to work remotely, the McKinsey study said, yes, almost 60% of US workers could do at least part of their work remotely. Um, and But it varies by industry. Um, more than two thirds of people who work in financial services or IT, uh, public administration uh, can work remotely. But on the other hand, fewer than 25% in uh, transportation and utilities, construction, leisure and hospitality. And, you know, it's hard to hard to be uh, in the commercial fishing business and work remotely. Uh, you've got to be there. And so it's not, uh, not for everybody and not for every industry. So we can ask, well, what can AI do for us? Artificial intelligence and generative artificial intelligence. And uh, these are some fairly recent data. And as you can see, it, the, the most common uses are for writing content, analyzing data, some customer support, and, and to a much lesser extent, uh, writing code and making certainly making strategic decisions. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Here's a, uh, a, a real problem though. Whereas 92% uh, of executives say that they are actively looking at incorporating AI and generative AI into their business operations, only 14% of employees are getting any training on, on these AI platforms, learning what they can do uh, and how they might be useful to them in their everyday work. And so from an HR perspective, that is definitely a red flag. And during the pandemic, as, as we know, there was a pretty dramatic contraction of international mobility. And uh, some of the estimates, you can see these on the slide, uh, more than half of international assignees had to re return to their home countries as the pandemic took hold. And um, about two thirds of multinationals delayed all or at least some international assignments. So a big question, and I know Ellen has posed that, is uh, what's the future of expatriation? If we think about leading hybrid teams, and, and Yang Sun mentioned at the outset that uh, more and more companies, whether multinational or not, are using hybrid teams, uh, how can technology help? Uh, a, a little scary statistic uh, from Gallup on the state of the American workforce, 2023, only about half of workers have a very clear idea of what's expected of them at work. And, uh, and that's a real problem because if you're working remotely or in a hybrid work arrangement and you're not sure what you're supposed to deliver by when at what standard of quality, uh, this can lead to serious problems and, uh, and uh, lack of coordination. And the sad thing is that, you know, with all this growth in remote and hybrid work, only 16% of the firms have changed how they manage performance. And so a big question I often get is uh, from managers is how can I, how can I manage them if I don't see them? Uh, I'm not there every day to see them. Um, now there are next generation performance management platforms like uh, Lattice, and uh, you can go online and find that. Uh, it gives managers and employees access to the same information and allows employees actually to request feedback from their managers. And that's important because as the research uh, company Forrester has identified, the strongest predictor of burnout is lack of recognition for accomplishment and hard work. And so we need to redouble our efforts to ensure that people are not unseen, unappreciated, or undervalued. At the same time, there are diminished incentives for international assignments. 
uh, expatriate, the traditional expatriate contracts that had had uh, generous allowances for housing, cars, schooling for kids, rarer than ever, except in in uh, very well established multinationals. Uh, the pandemic made everybody think about health and safety issues and reduced the willingness of many people to relocate internationally. And even in countries where MNEs are offering uh, special incentives and hardship pay, like India and China, are not appealing. So this is a concern for multinational organizations. And some key questions are, you know, what work can we actually do remotely? And where do we need to be on site? And if we think about the different types of work that are done in a multinational, transactional work, uh, this would be things like coordinating logistics, doing some customer support. Relational work, that's on site, like an on site audit. You've got to be there. Uh, you've got to have interpersonal relationships with people on the ground in different parts of the world. And the third is uh, management development, which of course was a uh, um, an overarching goal of so many expatriate assignments uh, is to learn how to operate in uh, international markets, how to adjust to a different culture and to build relationships in those markets that you can then leverage subsequently. <clears throat> so it's tough to, uh, you know, to, when you're doing this virtually, it's tough to maintain social ties and networks and to build an identity for your team. So we also need to ask about, from the company's perspective, um, what, what factors are affecting the willingness of employees to relocate internationally? And uh, what are the key health and safety considerations that they are thinking about? One of the ways that firms are dealing with the uh, several ways uh, is through flexible global work arrangements. I know that's quite an acronym there, FGWAs, but uh, this is what happens. It, employees engage physically uh, as part of their role, uh, but for a condensed and a very defined period, ranging from a day up to a year. Um, we talk about, uh, I hear about a lot from uh, um, international managers that employees are interested in working internationally, but they don't want to relocate over there for three to, to four years. And so I thought it might be helpful just to review some various types of these flexible global working arrangements. The first one is uh, international business travelers. They take short uh, international business trips without their families. Uh, and these typically range anywhere from one week to one month. Second is uh, flex, what we call flex patriots, and they travel for one to two months away from their home base um, without accompanying family members. A third approach is uh, international commuters. Now, this is obviously a lot easier in some on some continents than others. Uh, for example, if you're flying from Singapore to Thailand, uh, from Tokyo to Seoul, uh, from, uh, from Geneva to Milan. These are easier commutes uh, rather than hopping across continents. And so we don't typically see international commuters doing that. Um, rotational assignments. And uh, this is typical in hardship locations. And they, they work in the uh, hardship location for a short period of time and then they get more time to come back home. So they might work uh, two weeks on and two weeks off or a month over there and then a month back. And then uh, lastly, short-term international assignees. Uh, and these are the people who are uh, whose stay is longer than, than business travel, but shorter than expatriation. So somewhere in between. And many companies are experimenting with these flexible global working arrangements as a way to get the, the best benefits from an international assignment without actually having to relocate for a, a multi-year period of time. So there's clearly some advantages. Um, you know, they can complement virtual work arrangements and, uh, and, and they're a useful way to get global work done. Uh, you, you can build, facilitate uh, certainly 
team building, relationship building among members of global teams. Um, and uh, and they, they do facilitate the coordination and control of international operations. And they are especially valuable in places where you just can't find uh, host country nationals who have the skill sets that you need in order to get the work done. At the same time, there are clearly disadvantages, huh? a lot of inter international, a lot of stress. Uh, international travel, as so many of you know, looks very glamorous, but it certainly takes its toll. Uh, worry about career transitions, career transitions um, and social demands, the work family con uh, conflict. If you're not taking your family with you, uh, the issue of maintaining friendships and having a personal life these are real considerations for people. And uh, to counter these, um, people need, uh, the employees need a lot of formal and informal support, uh, like on-site assistance, uh, opportunities for continued professional development and adjustments in compensation for sure, and also some career counseling, uh, because um, it's easy uh, to lose sight of, uh, of career goals and to be unaware of uh, opportunities that might become available uh, within the firm. At the same time, companies can't re rely solely on technology. Um, and uh, Dean Smith was talking earlier about, you know, being on a Zoom with people from different continents, and it's great um, up to a point. Uh, on the other hand, I wanted to share with you the results of, of Microsoft's research with 60,000 US employees um, who shifted to firm-wide remote work. And what happened was that their collaboration networks became much narrower, the people that they were collaborating with, many fewer connections across networks. And we know that that's one of the big benefits um, of, of being in the office is that you get to meet people from uh, different functions, different departments. Um, there was definitely a decrease in synchronous communication. Communication at the same time, a lot more with asynchronous communication um, via email um, and, uh, and collaborative sharing of, of information. Uh, and these effects are likely to have negative impacts on how people acquire and share new knowledge. So some conclusions about international mobility, um, it's still likely to have an important role to play in coordination and control of, uh, of units, subsidiaries in multinationals. Uh, and the majority, of the most recent data that I've seen is the majority of multinationals see this as a temporary issue, the reduction in global mobility. Um, most say they were just postponing these international assignments not canceling them. Uh, many predict a return to pre-pandemic levels uh, within a year. Uh, on the other hand, the wide availability ability of, of video conferencing, Zoom, like we are doing right now. Um, but there's also at the same time, carbon reduction goals uh, of many companies. And that's those which suggest a lower level of business travel following the pandemic. So the jury is still out. This raises a number of, of research questions um, and that every company has to think about what, what aspects of global work can be done without being physically uh, uh, co-located. And where, where does performance suffer if you don't have it? We know relationship building is critical. Um, what, what predicts people's willingness to accept international assignments? And how can companies best um, identify, number one, and recruit the quality of employees, the quantity of employees that they need for international roles. They can't do that unless they know the key factors that people are considering as they mull over whether to accept an international role. And then a third point is uh, how do you develop key leadership competencies that you traditionally got through international assignments? Uh, you know, can that intensive experience of of living and working in the foreign culture be replicated in some other way, such as uh, 
the short-term international assignments or virtual global collaboration. So when we think about global work, there are challenges and changes that are happening on multiple levels. You can read those uh, at the societal level, at the organizational level. By the way, EDI is, is equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, and at the individual level, um, greater desire to work where one wants to work, the WFH, work from home, and, uh, and greater with tight labor markets, greater ability uh, to change jobs. These are all key considerations. So when we think about these, they lead to some managerial challenges. The first one is how can global managers help their people to develop critical cross-cultural competencies when their international assignments are virtual? Second, how can they manage these virtual communication platforms like Zoom or Microsoft Teams or Skype to minimize uh, fatigue? And uh, because it's hard to uh, look into a screen for hours on end and, and not get tired. Uh, how can we, uh, if you think about companies with global operations and the numbers of migrants that we are seeing as a result of natural disasters, economic opportunity, uh, how can they integrate uh, these folks and give them a sense of inclusion in their companies? Um, and what role, what is the role of global managers in promoting mentally healthy workplaces? Finally, um, how might, if you think about cultures, they can be loose or tight. And that refers to how much variability is there in, in what's expected of people in that culture. Uh, the United States, for example, is a very loose culture. Japan and, and many Asian countries would be much tighter cultures where there are stricter uh, expectations about how people behave. And how might the lack of co-location in international assignments affect employees in those cultures? These are important managerial challenges. And so clearly the future is now. And uh, I'll be, I'll be uh, happy to entertain questions if you have some, and I'll do my best to respond to them. So Ellen, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. Great, thank you. Sure. That was amazing. That was so much food for thought. Um, I particularly like the typology of the flexible global working assignment. So you've given us a lot to think about. Um, a couple of, I wanted to dive in and give our panelists um, a chance to respond to a couple of things. You had mentioned that 14 per, only 14% 14 of employees have received training on AI platforms. So I found that to be pretty fascinating because we've all heard that this can increase productivity and yet um, it is incumbent upon people to figure it out for themselves for the, you know, it sounds like. So I, and then you said only 16% have changed how they manage performance. Um, so Nancy, maybe I'll go to you first. Thinking about specific areas like recruitment, like learning and development, or um, which of these areas do you think benefits the most from our new technology? And what kind of examples do you want to share with us? Sure. You know, I think the one that comes to me most uh, often is the learning platforms. Um, and there are, there are several different learning platforms that um, a, with AI engines that can really help um, can help our employees to really focus on different trainings and then align the skills they're trying to build with recommendations for other trainings. And then also using that as a hub internally, organizationally, to be able to almost create an internal recruiting platform because recruiters can look. And one of the challenges, I think even, you know, just generally is we don't often know the talent that we have in the organization. And when, with, with, with AI technology, it not only helps us externally recruit, but it really bolsters um, the environment from an internal perspective for our internal employees to be able to showcase themselves differently and for us to align competencies and learnings and then search for folks that have built those competencies. 
Oh, I love that. I'm actually having my students create digital learning pathways this mm -hmm. semester. So that's, I'm going to add that to the, you know, the what's in it for you kind of thing. I love that. Um, Roberto, I'm going to give you the same question. I bet you have, a, you know, other <laughs> ideas and different coming from recruiting in the military background. Yes, yes. So uh, thank you very much. Great question. I, you know what? I'm also going to piggyback on her on her answer. It is true. You know what? We have with, uh, in the Secret Service, we have a program. It's called ITIS, okay? Individual Training um, Assessment System. And there, you know, you were assigned a certain amount of uh, training that's prescribed to us per year. But at the same time, you could also take external training so that way you could cross-reference yourself and make yourself more marketable. With that marketable training, you could definitely, you know, be able to transfer into internally and seek other positions available. Uh, with the Secret Service, we have so many different kind of variety of jobs. Not only are we doing protection, we're also doing investigations. But at the same time, we're also doing uh, training development, talent development. You know, we're also definitely expanding with the, you know, employee wellness programs. We're definitely expanding in the human resources. I mean, we just had, um, just recently in uh, November, uh, I went to a training facility and you should have seen it. I mean, we had to build two conference rooms together because we had so many HR professionals there. Most of them already had their doctorate degrees because of the advancements in the educational platform. And just like she mentioned, you know what? Internally, we have a lot of candidates or a lot of employees that constantly are looking for self-development. And yes, we use that as a recruiting tool. I use that as a recruiting tool. Like today, I went over there to, uh, you know, to one of the colleges and I was out there recruiting and some of the kids came over and uh, some of the candidates came over and the first thing they asked, what kind of learning platforms do you have available for me to advance my career? You know what? That's a great question. Let me tell you how the career path goes and at what point we continue the learning pathway to make yourself a much better employee for us. So I could definitely, you know, definitely relate to that answer. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, um, Wayne was talking about that I was just like going back in my time. And I was like, wow, I did that at, you know, at the Steve Dorian, just like he was talking about the port being automated. Yes. When I used to work at Metro Ports, Nautilus, that was a Steve Dorian company. And a lot of the workers that we employed were longshoremen. And the first thing that they said, am I going to lose my job because of this automation? And, you know, this automation is definitely going to be something that AI is going to take over. And how is that going to impact my family's livelihood and also the city? Because it's not just impacting just the employee. It's the family. Now the family has to move. Now the city's losing money. Now everything is impacted, being impacted. So how does, how does the, you know, how does the recruiting, the talent, the building, the companies expand on that to help not only their, their you know, the profit margin, but also at the same time, make sure that the city functions in a respectable way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wayne, I'm watching your nonverbals and I feel like you want to jump in here and say something. Um, did you want to um, add anything? You gave us so many great, but I, I'm suspecting. Well, just to build on, on what Roberto mm -hmm. was just saying and, and Nancy was saying, the, there's the great fear about the me questions. You know, what about me? What about my family? What about my job and my career and and my future? And if only 14% of companies are offering any exposure to employees about what these platforms can do, uh, it's just going to stoke the fears that their jobs are at risk. And, uh, and the best thing, it's just like from an educational perspective, we often, I've been talking to a lot of profs and asking them, do they use chat GPT in class or allow students to use it in class? And I, I, I don't know how you feel about this, but my own view is the worst thing we could do would be to prohibit it. And the reason is employers want people with current skill sets. Mm -hmm. And if they don't get a chance to practice and use this in an, in an ethical way to learn about the advantages and also the drawbacks, um, then we're not we're doing them a disservice and and that's true also in the workplace um we've we've got to level with people about what these technologies can do and can't do ask for their help in identifying places where they might be able to use them and exploit the technology but unless we make those kinds of investments 
um, the kind of, of fear and misinformation that's that has been spreading will just continue. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> you know what, Wayne? If I could, if I could touch on that, as a matter of fact, one of the questions that they asked today uh, for the Secret Service, we're looking for a federal resume. It's a lot mm -hmm. different than a regular resume. A lot of people, you know, were trying to hand me over their three pages of resume, and I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, that's great, and Danny, but I cannot accept the resume. First and foremost, it has to be in a federal resume you know, profile or a profile on USAA jobs. Well, how long is that resume? Well, usually we want a resume for a federal job to be seven to 10 pages, right? And they're like, I don't have that much information, that much stuff. One person was, the first thing they said was, can I use chat GPT? And I'm like this, yes, you can, but you cannot exaggerate your skills. And mm -hmm. that's where it comes into play. Am I exaggerating my skills or am I, you know, actually showing you my skills and transferring my skills in the proper way so that way you could look at the skills that I have available to perform that that function. And that's where it's kind of like, uh, you know, I was telling them like this, okay, well, we have the resume reader, we have this, we have that. Someone's going to read your resume. So make sure that it's correct and accurate and it reflects you because you're going to have to speak to that. You know, so a really interesting statistic, it, it's a little off off topic, but a, a really interesting statistic is that upwards of 80% of job seekers are now using mobile devices to apply for jobs. Yes. And of those 80%, about half of them never actually finish the application because it takes too many clicks to be able yes. to do it on this small device. Yes. So this is a real opportunity at, on the one hand um, for companies to devise more efficient ways of attracting candidates without having to go through 51 clicks to be able to apply for a job. But uh, the other side to that point as well is, you know, there's also, uh, you know, kind of the platform for video interviews and, mm -hmm. uh, and video, you know, resumes for someone to really just be able to to talk about themselves and to, you know, do do their resume in that fashion. And I see, I think the world is changing, particularly as we think about the DEI space. You know, I think, you know, 20 years ago, we wanted to check every single box for a job. And I think now, you know, at least, and I've, I've done it for a long time, it said, you know, we have to look at, you know, if somebody's 50% or 60% has what we want, then we can help train and we want they want a job because they want the other experiences you know you know we can't wait for that you know perfect candidate and so there are so many different ways technology is supporting that piece as well and i could see a space for certainly for video resumes being becoming much more um you know i think effective and and desired mm -hmm. you know uh i was speaking with a student uh, this week and they were well, again, this is this is the time we have people graduating in December and then we have seniors. And even though we have all this technology and we have all this help, um, people still have so much anxiety, so much trepidation. And, you know, one was sharing with me that they went on an interview. They did all the right networking things. They had an internal contact. They prepared for the interview. Um and they didn't get the job. And they went back and asked the recruiter for feedback. And 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 the recruiter actually gave them feedback. And you know, and I said, that's a really good thing. What else can we do with technology to humanize the experience? So we have big interview, we have VMOC here at LMU, but what could we do to to humanize the whole human resource management? <laughs> Alan, um, uh, one thing we do know is uh, th there have been some very disturbing statistics that came out recently about the candidate experiences from people who applied for jobs. And um, uh, in, the, in the most recent data that I saw, 60% of them said that even two months after they submitted their applications, they never heard anything. Right. And only 7% ever heard that they didn't get the job. It just was zero communication. And yet every applicant tracking system, ATS, which of course is using is, is being used by, by companies to screen resumes, extract keywords, things like that. Every one of those applicant tracking systems has the capability to generate at least thank you notes. And with generative AI, what we're seeing 
is they actually have the they they have the capability to develop personalized responses to candidates. And, mm. and if you think about it, you know, many, so many big companies um, want people to leave. As they get so many applications. They can't hire most of the people who apply. Only a small percentage are going to get hired. But you want them to leave with a really good feeling about how they were treated. You know, that they were treated fairly, given a fair shot to apply for jobs they were qualified for. And if you don't even ever respond to them, that you received their application or they didn't get the job or to keep them updated on where they are in the process, artificial intelligence can do all of those things right now. And mm -hmm. there's no excuse for companies not using it. Mm -hmm. I, I love that because then it also creates, this is the kind of thing that people remember and feel like they are treated like a human being. And then it makes them want to possibly apply there in the future. Or so, buy their products, <laughs> yeah. use their services. I mean, just like everybody, everybody goes into Google. They go into Glassdoor. They go into uh, salary.com. They look at the reviews. Before they apply to the company, they see an opening. They go into those reviews and they start looking for, hey, what do these employees do? How are these employees happy? What kind of wellness program do they have? Are they getting back to them? You know what? I took this job. I took the interview. Uh, the recruiter told me everything was good about it but never responded. I got ghosted. That's the word that they're using mm -hmm. right now. But just like you said, we do have that capability. I know we, on our platform, we use monster.gov. We're switching over to USA staffing uh, because it's a more um, personable kind of, uh, kind of platform where we actually do have the candidate go in. They have a certain amount of questions. I know Wayne said 51 clicks. We actually, well, you know, we're pretty bad at that. It is a secret service though. We got to be very specific of who we hire. <laughs> We have 107 questions. I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, 107 <laughs> questions. So it is quite a bit of, of uh, screening. But at the same time, you know, if one of those questions is a self, um, you know, um, disqualifying questions, it's going to let you know within the next 10 minutes. Hey, thank you very much for your application. We regret to inform you. You self-eliminated yourself due to this question. It is. It, it, and, you know, they get an email right there and then. So we're trying to do the best of the candidate experience. We go in there and I look at the reviews because mm -hmm. I look at the region. You know, what is my reviews about the candidate experience? And if it's a 4.5 and above, I'm doing my job because I'm letting the candidates know, hey, even though you didn't get a job, we still want you to think about it. And maybe there's other opportunities in the future that you could apply to. Hmm. Great. Um, I am going to actually go ahead and pose another question there. Let's, let's think about the development of our leaders. So our, our future global leaders, what, how can we use technology? What do we need to be doing to develop those global competencies? Um, you know, particularly as we mentioned, there may be restrictions on travel. Um, and we know that a lot of times we can have a Zoom call instead of getting together in person. So what are your thoughts on global leadership development and the use of technology? Maybe I'll, I'll start with Nancy. Yeah, you know, I, I think one of the greatest things that we have to think about when we're not traveling uh, to other countries that we're doing businesses in is how do we really help people to understand the culture and the way business is done in the in different countries, right? Because absent that, when we're in a just a Zoom environment, we assume our own values or the our own ways of doing things. So I think it still becomes really important and technology can play a role in that by helping people, you know, do some cultural training so they mm -hmm. understand um, how to work um, in that environment. Because different cultures are not as open to, you know, offering an answer, you know, you may have to allow the space for that to happen. And, you know, in Zoom technology, sometimes people, you know, they will have a tendency to overspeak um, for, for other folks. And so I think when you're when you're in country in different cultures, you you have to pay attention to those things because you can very quickly, you know, um, lose your uh, 
business welcome in those countries if, if you're not paying attention to the cultures. And I think that's a real key thing because um, we're operating in a global world and whether we're operating in the U.S. or we're operating in another country, you know, expats coming to the U.S. or, or vice versa, you know, the, the, the awareness of the culture and being and, and understanding that has a critical impact on the business. So technology can help from the learning platform, um, from also spending time getting people to know each other a little bit and not always always be many countries, unlike the U.S., are more about the relationships than we sometimes are in the U.S. So it's very important for that relational component to happen. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. And Roberto, is there anything you want to add on with that or? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, you know, with the Secret Service, we have 130 national resident offices and uh, field offices, but we also have 20 international offices. I know that before we send a special invest. Uh, special agent in charge to one of those offices, they have to get into the cultural because they're going to be spending about three to five years at that location. So just like Nancy said right now, you know, you have to be able to adapt. You have to be able to train. You have to be able to manage that leadership that you're going to be away from, uh, like we like to say in the military, from the flagpole. So you have to be that person that has to be able to make decisions on the spot that are going to influence, you know, the whole nation, pretty much the whole world. Because when we have the president or the POTUS to come in to that special country and where he's doing a mission, that person is in charge technically. He is the, the you know, the chief of the security uh, mm -hmm. secret service at that location. So we definitely want to build that we have senior executive leadership classes with the secret service that everybody can take or everybody can adapt to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ellen. Um Ellen, one of the things that, uh, you know, I think your question was about uh, leadership development. Mm -hmm. And um, and Nancy made, made the excellent point that, uh, you know, you, you've got to be able to understand the culture, the people that you're dealing with, the constraints that they face. And from the point of view of virtual teams, global virtual teams, I know that one of the questions you had posed was how do we improve communication and productivity and mm -hmm. trust in these teams? And, uh, and the, the companies that seem to do it best, and there's a long line of research that backs this up, what they use is a, uh, is a combination of uh, in-person and virtual uh, meetings. Uh, and, and, and I know uh, those, those of you who have been involved in this before would nod your heads and you say, well, when I've had a chance to meet somebody mm -hmm. overseas and then I see them online, we seem to get along a lot. Things go a lot more smoothly. And so company, some companies, especially multinationals, uh, might have quarterly meetings in, in different parts of the world where people can come together and get to know each other a little bit. And, and, and that helps in terms of professional development, in terms of appreciating um, the cultures that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of uh, virtual and Every once in a while, at least in person, co-located, we get together and, and get to know each other. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, I, what about um, virtual reality? And I we experimented with that a little bit here. And I know uh, Stanford, for example, has a lab where they give people the experience of engaging in different cultures, um, even in different social settings, like the experience of being unhoused. What do you, what's, what's the word on the street um, with virtual reality? And what do you see as the future? How's that being used? Well, Walmart is actually using it right now to select mm -hmm. middle managers. And, uh, and what happens is people put on the virtual reality headsets and what they see is, uh, um, examples of the kinds of situations they would face, like an irate customer, for example, if you were promoted. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people will just self-select out then and there and say, look, I, I don't want to deal with this. Um, but for others, uh, they find that, um, that, that this is something they can succeed at. Mm -hmm. So Walmart's trying to make, give people as realistic a picture as they can uh, about what it would be like for you to move up to an assistant store manager or a store manager. I, I was just talking recently with uh, Ang Soon, who's in Singapore at, at NTU, 
And she and her team for years have been developing um, video um, uh, simulations of intercultural exchanges, you know, yeah. in, in the concept of cultural intelligence. There's no reason why you couldn't do those using virtual reality. Mm -hmm. If you think about that, where you're going to interact, you're going to do a sales call on somebody in, uh, you know, and in, in, you're in Argentina mm -hmm. you know, or some other country. I'm going to ask one more kind of a rapid fire question. I didn't give this to you before, but I, I, I know it won't be a problem. There's such a deluge of information coming at us. And here we have three experts um, who can curate content. What's your very favorite? book, podcast, um, piece of information right now, if people want to learn more about the impact of technology on global human resource management, like what's one thing that they should definitely be looking at? Uh, anyone can jump in and answer that. Let me see if I can. The, the Economist magazine has done a number of, they've done podcasts mm -hmm. on AI and mm -hmm. also um, uh, a cover story on uh, thinking uh, thoughtfully uh, about mm -hmm. asking thoughtful questions about AI. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, for, for something that would be short and to the point and easily understandable, uh, that's where I would go. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, I think also there's been a fair amount of writing in um, Harvard Business Review, and then they also have some uh, leadership chats that they um, that you can subscribe to as well. And and so they then they go through current topics of of things that are going on. So not only are you getting sometimes this getting the scholar perspective, you're also getting that practical aspect of of the of what is going on in the real world as well. So I uh, I lean a little bit there as well. Great. Roberta, anything you wanted to add or should we, I know we're, shall we go to the questions? Thank you. We'll go to the questions. I was thinking about all the books and right now that I got in my head. Yeah, we'll go ahead. We, uh, this has been so great. I'm going to go ahead and go to the questions. Let's see. Um, from Francisco Valley, Mr. Castillo and others, how do you verify that the information provided by international applicants or employees is truthful, <laughs> including verification of education? We know this is a major is issue domestically. Yes. yes. Has there been a number of um, what we've seen with uh, with virtual interviews is, uh, and, and I don't know how common it is, but it does exist. Um, bait and switch routines so that the person in the interview is not the same person who shows up for work. Oh, and, uh, and the way that companies are dealing with that two, two things. One of them is uh, during the interview, they actually have them present a identification card with a picture on it, some type of government ID. Uh, and the other approach is to uh, not hire anybody without uh, just on the basis of a virtual interview. So requiring some in-person contact as part of the hiring, the staffing process. Fascinating. Bait and switch is very important. It's like a bad dating scenario. <laughs> yes. Uh, when I was uh, recruiting for the Steve Dorian company, we had a couple of, uh, you know, uh, operations managers from the outside that knew about international shipping. And, uh, you know, we had to do the verifications. We had to verify their education. So we would ask them, hey, you know what? You're going to need to be able to translate your education, you know, into U.S. standards. So that way we could look at them or go to the nearest embassy or consulate. So that way you could you could verify that you are who you are. And especially if they're going to be coming over to conduct their paperwork, they got to do the H-1B visa. And uh, so that's technically they have to go to the to the consulate or embassy. So those individuals that were actually that we were thinking about hiring, if they weren't who they were, I mean, they would automatically, hey, you know what? Thank you very much for the opportunity. I no longer want this position or I found a position. That's how we knew that, you know, uh, maybe they weren't the right person or maybe they weren't the right person itself. So. <laughs> 
Got it. Thank you. We'll do one more. And then I know we probably need to wrap up. So from whom and this is in what ways can AI and technology in general be leveraged to provide training and development opportunities that are culturally relevant and can better resonate with employees from various backgrounds in global companies? So how do we do leverage technology to provide more culturally relevant? Yeah, uh, Ellen, I'll just take a quick shot at that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, for years, we've known about something called the cultural assimilator. Mm -hmm. And the cultural assimilator was usually presented in written form. And what it was, was uh, you would read a page that described a situation that you see. Um, and, uh, and, and then the question was, um, what's the best way to deal with this situation in, in, in this particular culture? And uh, it, it was used branching, you know, if you got the right answer, that's fine. If you didn't, it would direct you to what the right answer was and why. There's no reason why that can't be, that we can't use technology to leverage those things, make them much more relevant for people than the printed page mm -hmm. and actually use uh, native uh, native individuals in those cultures to uh, to, to reenact those situations and then asking people, how would you deal with this if you encountered this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I actually think the technology gives us much more flexibility um, to incorporate uh, the, the cultural aspects um, because I, I think you may often get folks from so many different backgrounds in a, in a training class or in a classroom, as, as you, I'm sure you know, Ellen, um, and, and you certainly, Wayne, as well, you know, and so ha having some awareness of, you know, how to, uh, you know, how different people learn, how pe different people interact, um, technology can really be helpful in, in building those into the training courses and to help with that. Great. Well, I believe we are my goodness, close. We are at time. I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much to our panelists, uh, to our hosts and our participants. Uh, this was absolutely so stimulating and I'm very grateful. I'm going to hand it back to Young Sen. Okay. Ellen, thank you so much for moderating such an intriguing panel discussion. I also like to thank Wayne, Nancy, and Roberto for sharing your insights and experiences with us about this very timely and important topic today. I know most of our audience are students. As you heard from our speakers, I think it's still absolutely important to have a firsthand cultural experiences. So if you want to prepare international business career. I strongly encourage you to participate in LMU study abroad program before you graduate. So in addition to its capstone course, which includes a study trip to Costa Rica, management department is offering or going to offer two special international business courses for the upcoming spring semester sponsored by the Center for Asian Business. So the first course I'd like to promote is Exploring Asian Culture Course, mm -hmm. which is designed for freshmen and sophomores, which incorporates a two-week field trip to Korea and Taiwan. Uh, if you have any questions, I think that, that you know, you can ask that um, um, the Marky or to me after this webinar. And the other course is a global sustainability course, which is designed for the juniors and seniors, uh, which includes a two-week field trip to Korea and Indonesia next spring. Mm. Now, we need to wrap up the webinar, as Ella mentioned, that I'd like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I hope you have enjoyed the program, and we'll be back with a new program in spring 2024. Until then, please stay safe and healthy. Before you leave, I would really appreciate it if you could complete a short survey at the end of this webinar. Once again, thank you so much, everyone, and good night. Good night.